Well, good morning. Chairman Marino, Minority Vice Chair Kim Benzi, and distinguished members, I want to thank you so very much for taking up my uh, bill, House Bill 4897. Um, and I appreciate this opportunity to talk to you about what this bill strives to do. But before I get into that, I'd like to provide some historical context. In fact, it was on a Tuesday, September 3rd, 2019 that a 10 bill package led by my colleague, uh, Representative Sabo from the 92nd District, was introduced to reform Michigan's unemployment system and expand qualifications and the benefits period. The intent of that bill package was to make whole thousands of Michigan workers who were impacted by false fraud claims due, th due to the woefully faulty Michigan Integrated Data Automated System, known as MIDAS. And one very memorable um, case was one of my own constituents who came to my office, Mrs. Mays and her husband out of Redford, unannounced, clearly distraught. Um, she had received several letters from UIA saying that she was going to be in collections. Um, she was afraid of losing her car. And the ordeal had completely, clearly, physically, and emotionally made her ill. And fortunately, through working with the um, uninsured, Unemployment Insurance Agency, my office was able to very quickly help her and remedy that situation. But Ms. Mays is not alone. There were some 34,000 other Michiganders who were also wrongfully accused. And so I was very happy to be a part of this package, and I'm very um, excited that you decided to take this particular bill up so that we can help her and, and help ourselves better understand the conditions of, of the system. So um, we all know that there's still much more work that needs to be done. And during this coronavirus era, it, era, it has shown a, shown a light on our um, shortcomings and also provided a path to opportunities of improvement in how we move forward. And so before you today, I think, is one small step towards that reform. With House Bill 4897, we try to attempt to do that. And it's an important step because this is important legislation because it will provide analysis and the data, the scope and magnitude of unpaid and delinquent employers' unemployment insurance taxes, which would provide a peephole to the future or maybe the beginning of a blueprint for a preparedness plan. So what does the bill do? Let's get into it. This bill, the overarching themes are three basic concepts. One, it will require the unemployment agency to adopt a methodology to reduce the amount of unpaid delinquent employer taxes. Two, to survey employers on various statistical and analytical data points related to employer unemployment insurance taxes. And three, provide a report to the legislature of that information, specifically to committees like this and the Appropriations Committee that would handle unemployment issues. But among those various data points, it would include the percent of unemployment insurance taxes that are uncollectible, the percentage paid on time, average length of time of outstanding receivables, the number of employers that were issued assessments for unpaid taxes, the amount of delinquent employer taxes recovered, delinquent employer tax accounts referred to the Attorney General for collection and the UIA's rate of success in those cases, a comparable of the percentage of accounts receivable versus employer taxes that are due at the end of a given calendar year, and an estimate of the fiscal impact of unemployed, I mean of employ, unpaid employer unemployment insurance taxes on the unemployment compensation fund balance. And that's the sweet part, the sweet spot, Mr. Chair. At the heart of the matter is the fiscal impact on the unemployment compensation trust fund and keeping it solvent. And this bill will require the UIA to collect vital data that will not only inform our decisions and their decisions, but also ensure that employers are paying their unemployment insurance tax, which will help ensure that the fund remains in solvency. So in closing, um, I read some articles about this, and I wanted to share these quotes with this committee. In a May 2020 article, M Live article titled, Michigan's unemployment system is better than most states, but that's 
code comfort for those it failed. Michelle Evermore, senior policy analyst for the National Employment Law Project said, and I quote, the unemployment trust fund in every state in the country are in danger of drying up. The CARES Act include one billion for state unemployment trust funds, but it's not clear whether that will be enough, end quote. Christopher O'Leary, in the same article, he's a senior economist at W.E. Upton Institute for Employment Research, predicted in Michigan the trust fund will incur as much as a $15 billion deficit. And Whitmer also indicated the trust fund could be in trouble, requiring the state to take out a loan with the federal government. And according to a report from the George Mason University uh, McCarty Center, in the next two years, 40 states unemployment insurance funds may be completely depleted. The state will need, the states across the nation will need 90 billion in federal loans to keep paying benefits. But you may know, at least of, as of 2019, the end of the fourth quarter 2019, Michigan's unemployment trust fund had a fund balance of 4.6 billion at the end of that quarter. The third highest state trust fund balance in the entire country. And you may also know that 90% of the 1.65 million Michiganders have received more than $5.6 billion in benefits, according to the State Labor Department. And then, if you looked at the news this week, you know that the UIA announced it would lengthen its UIA benefit period an extra 20 weeks. And the state is using the Federal Extended Benefits Program to fund the extension, bringing the total to 59 weeks of unemployment payments. That's huge. This is the state of Michigan taking care of its unemployed workers. And it means that a person who qualified, who had lost their job in March 2020, will receive a benefit, if they're eligible, through April 2021. That's a long time. So we want to make sure that our fund is solvent and we have that information that we need um, uh, that we're collecting through this bill so that it, fun it, it funds, it informs, I'm sorry, our decisions. So if you're wondering what happened to those other bills, I'll say this. Some of those issues were adopted in the executive order. Um, for example, the governor extended benefits of the self or self-employed people, the gig economy workers, the 1099 independent contractors. She removed red tape in the system to expedite the process of receiving benefits. And she allowed the state to only review the current causes of unemployment when it comes to a resident's eligibility for state benefits and suspended the need for a, uh, a work search waiver. Unemployment insurance programs across the nation have been concerned about insolvency. Putting pressure on states to raise payroll taxes, cut benefits, or seek federal loans. None of these options are desirable for us in Michigan, especially when individuals need the benefits most and states can least afford to increase taxes. So looking for best ways to provide unemployment workers with income security without exhausting the state's unemployment fund is something we need to all be cognizant of. And House Bill 4897 will provide critical information for which the agency, can, the agency and the legislature can act upon and remedy, and I ask for your support. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative. And uh, I did have one uh, just clarification. Uh, Leo should be able to comply with this reporting requirement without any additional uh, appropriations being needed, any additional FTEs, so they sh should fully be able to comply. I believe so. It looks like that in the fiscal analysis. Yeah. I just want okay. to highlight that for members. So. All right. Uh, do we have any further questions for Representative Lip? Uh, Representative Bosniak. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hi, Rep. How are you doing? Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, with regard to the, uh, well, the future aspects of this bill, what do you hope to get from UIA overall that's different than what they're doing now? Oh, these, these data points. Um, that we're collecting and reporting that uh, we don't currently know and to have that report shared with the legislature and explain to us. Okay, because I know in my office and probably in your office, I've had s over 700 people apply 
and only 500 that we've closed out. So we still got a gap there at 200, and we haven't been able to shrink that. Uh, are you, is, does this bill address any of that? No, not directly. So this bill r really does an analysis of how we're collecting that employer unemployment insurance tax. If we're collecting it, how many are delinquent, what's outstanding, and that informs us for the, the balance we need to keep in that fund. This is a federal state kind of combination um, um, fund situation. And so we want to know where do we stand and where especially now that we've had this unexpected overwhelming need for the benefit. Good. Good start, Rep. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Uh, any further questions? Minority Vice Chair Kim Benzie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my question revolves around it looks like there is an appropriation for an upgrade um, in the fiscal analysis is that possibly what the chair was referring to um, or it's just an appropriation I guess to oh forgive me I was going off the house fiscal analysis and uh, members if you look under the fiscal impact the second sentence that says the reporting requirement of the bill would likely be offset by existing appropriations for the Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity so that was what my question was on. I guess my question is, um, because I had a lot of cases to this, um, you know, during the pandemic that um, basically people were held up by one employee that they may have worked for who simply didn't turn in um, or report or pay that unemployment insurance and it held up everything for them. And mm. just trying to get to what the holdup was, who it was, um, was extremely difficult and weeks and weeks and weeks were going on and I my question is is do we have the appropriate software right now in the UIA department to even you know manage the funds collect the funds um, report the funds properly and and I think having a new staffer come in in May in my office um, when we switched over to how we were going to start following cases and tracking them I mean right away he said we can easily, you know, section off certain cases. Some of them have to do with money and funding. Some of them have to do with uh, more information needed that's going to take more time. He came up with a way instantly to kind of get half of them off of his plate very quickly. Hmm. Um, well, the other ones probably needed someone assigned to them. And I'm just wondering if it's a combination of the software um, training and, and just making sure that um, the people that are in the department actually can utilize um, the software or find better ways to make it more efficient. Because that was my frustration. And I, yeah. I understand what you're saying. Um, I had people that were in tears and none of us could get in and, and really see what was going on to help them. But it turned out more often than not that someone hadn't paid or, mm. you know, mm -hmm. it was mm -hmm. on the employer end. Okay. Well, that is an important question, and you better watch out because your staffer might go over to UIA and help them out over there with all those good ideas. So, um, um, yes, in my office, like probably all of yours, have experienced that same frustration with the slow response. And I think that's, uh, and to, uh, to answer the specifics of your question, it's probably better for UIA to do that. Um, but that is a part of why this, I think, is a really important piece of le legislation to understand how, how many employers are delinquent on those taxes, to come up with a methodology of, of, of documenting that and finding out are, are they late, why they're late, um, and receiving those and making sure there's a process and a procedure to do that. So they, they do it in some degree now, but this will but make you really sit back and analyze what are we doing and what kind of information do we want to extract from this that will help inform our decisions. What do we need to do differently? What works well? So I think that will help make sure that employers are paying into that fund and receiving that. 